Good afternoon and a warm welcome to our Conversations in Design session. I'm Claire German, Managing Director at the Design Centre. In this exciting format, we're keeping our community engaged and inspired wherever they are. We're bringing together designers, industry insiders and media hosts for some great conversations online. And now to our speakers. By the power of technology, I'm delighted to introduce John and Catherine Porson, beaming in from Home Farm, their home in Oxfordshire. We're in for such a treat as this session is not only about design, but the pleasure of cooking and eating. And who better to chair it than Carol Annette, Interiors Editor of Country and Townhouse. And so without further ado, over to you, Carol, and thank you all for tuning in. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. And I am delighted today to be joined by architect John and his interior design wife, Catherine Paulson, from their kitchen at Home Farm, their house in the heart of the English countryside on the edge of the Cotswolds. Five years in the making, the house was built to unite friends and relatives in a bucolic, simple setting. And John and Catherine have just released their first book together, Home Farm Cooking. I have one here and I can vouch for the recipes in it. Um, welcome, it's lovely to be to see you and thank you very, very much for joining us today. Um, well, it's very nice for us too. Thank you. Catherine, it's an absolutely beautiful book um, and I'm, I'm, you know, we wouldn't expect anything less from the pair of you, but could you give us an insight into how it came about? So 20 years ago, John did a cookery book with a professional cook and food writer Annie Bell Your professional. called Living Thing, <laughs> which has become a kind of a cult book and I have to say it's been my cookery bible for the last 20 years and the publisher Fiden wanted to do a new book and John very very bravely suggested that I did it with him. <laughs> Was that brave in the sense that you have to brave in the sense that <laughs> A, we have to collaborate together, and B, I'm not a professional cook. So that's and, really how it came about. And well, so did you work alongside Annie? Not on this book, no. But she's obviously been a huge inspiration to me over the last 20 years. So it's, it's from the heart, and it's very much the two of you together. Yes, and it's actually what we, what we eat at home and what we how we live. The book is also about the house as well as being about the food we eat in the house. Well, well Catherine always said, I don't mind doing the cooking, which is really, really nice, for, um, as long as you tell me what you want to eat. So <laughs> I thought the easiest way is to... So know. that's how the first book came, came, came along with Annie Bell, was I was very happy to, be, to cook, but I just want to know what everyone wants to eat. Yeah, absolutely. I, I absolutely agree. And quite unusually, John, I understand that you have three kitchens at home farm. Well, of course, the, the, the flippant answer is uh, you're never too far from a coffee. <laughs> <clears throat> but I mean, the way because it, because we bought a, a disordered farmyard uh, where there were all these disparate buildings and uh, at strange angles, um, <clears throat> it's it means that it's something like 50 meters long. So we needed, we needed a, a kitchen in the farmhouse and then we wanted to have a kitchen in the barn for entertaining. And then there's a guest cottage or a guest quarters. So there's a kitchen in that. But it does allow you a lot of flexibility, especially when all the um, kids have been at home um, during lockdown. So um, it means that each one's been able to have their own kitchen, which uh, means there's been no friction in the whole 12 months. Mm. <laughs> That's pretty good going. I'll take my hat off to you. Yeah, not and, bad. And the house was largely um, derelict when you took it on. Yes, yeah. Did you, um, did you automatically have a vision for how you wanted it to be? Did you know that that was how you were going to lay it out with the space and with the different kitchens? Um, more, more or less. I mean, it, it, it's incredibly daunting for anybody else that's that's not used to doing this kind of thing i mean catherine uh you know it, i mean it, it she thought it was a bit a bit too challenging but uh, and so did some of our friends but i um, mean this is what i do our so. friends would arrive to look at this newly bought purchase and their faces were just <laughs> <laughs> blanche was how on earth were we going to cope with this horrible mess 
but you know i mean we, we do new buildings obviously as an architectural uh, office but we also do a lot of um, restoration so this is this is you know normal stuff but a bit and, scary when it's your own yeah i'm sure and um and how long did it take you to get it to where you're happy with it oh very very quick it was only five years i think <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it was painstaking and took forever. Yeah, I can imagine it. And you, when you first opened the book, actually, one of the first sentences that I read that I thought was um, was a really beautiful entry to the to the book is that you say when you first move into a place, it's natural to interrogate the details of the patterns of the life you bring with you, and and the kind of idea of encompassing how you want to live in in that space as opposed to where as opposed to your city life. And the very fact that you have come together and, and put all these recipes in a book, I mean, it, it, that you sort of, it, it seems very um, bucolic and beautiful. And, and I'm sure there were all sorts of um, challenges when it came to writing the book, but it has a sort of peaceful narrative throughout um, and those and absolutely stunning images. Um, but Catherine, I also wanted to ask, um, as an interior designer, we know you collaborated on the recipes, but did you have a say in the way the kitchens looked and how they work? I was very specific about how the kitchens work, especially how they work from an ergonomic point of view. I knew exactly how I wanted the spices to be stored, the trays to be stored, pots and pans stored. I wanted ovens at eye level. So I was very, very precise about what I wanted. But when it came to finishes, I didn't actually have any say at all. <laughs> and I, in the one kitchen, I've got a pure white lassa worktop, pure white marble lassa worktop, which has an incorporated sink in it. So in fact, it, it turns out that it is very practical, but I don't think I would have chosen that had I been had I had any say at all and also I don't have any handles on any of the cupboards so you have to push all the cupboards or sometimes you have to kick them quite hard at the bottom but anyway John didn't want to have any <laughs> handles at all but I was very precise about how I wanted all <clears> the <throat> small machines plugged in so that they're ready to go so I have that but although they're all behind cupboard doors so things like the magic mix and all, all those small machines are plugged in and ready to go and so I knew exactly what I wanted from a working point of view in the kitchen. And, and I actually, would like to have gas, but there's no gas in the area. So I, I have induction hobs, which I actually now completely love. But I wouldn't have chosen those. And, and in a way, it's much more difficult to design a working kitchen where, where it does look so beautifully serene and calm because you have to, it's storage is imperative. Storage is imperative, and, but I have a, a double cupboard. Just, you can't see it in this picture, but there's a whole wall of cupboards and there's a double cupboard I can open. So I can put any of the mess inside the cupboard in the course of a meal. You know, if, there are a whole, if there's a whole lot of mess, I can just put it in the cupboard, close the doors. We had one brilliant um, uh, Danish chef who came came over to uh, to, to do a lunch, and uh, he they didn't want any of the you know the mess on show for for this uh, lunch, so he put all all the saucepans he'd been using he put them without cleaning them behind the cupboard door or back in the oven <laughs> yeah so that you, you opened all the things and there was it was like a surreal thing of, of used pots everywhere it was quite quite fun. <laughs> Um, and what about, so John, t talk us through some of the textures and surfaces, because uh, that's a very, very um, brave, you know, a, a lot, I'm sure a lot of the kitchens that you design actually are not, are not used that often. And so I can imagine, you know, a white marble sink, um, you know, in a lot of places would be absolutely fine. But in a kitchen where you're going to be um, using it a lot, that's quite a challenging thing. Do you, do you, Put something like like that in, knowing that it's going to age and have a patina, um, or is it very much about you? It has to remain pristine. 
No, no. <clears throat> I mean, I, uh, I mean, I'm. I think a pattern of wood is beautiful, and I think, you know, you, sometimes you go on holiday to these Italian uh, um, villages, and and they've, you know, they've just used a white Carrara uh, sink for a couple of hundred years, and it, and, it, and it looks so beautiful. I mean, I mean, these happen to be pure white marble, so then they're, they're even sort of uh, purer, but it's. It's carved out of one piece, so it, it has a sort of solidity and, and it and it does work. I mean, it's um, if if you get the odd mark, that's you know that's you know as you said, it's part of the pattern. And it's also very actually very very pleasing to use a pure white sink. It just feels feels good. I'm sure. The only thing that irritates me is that, that sometimes people think it's Korean. So it's, <laughs> I, I, You're like, got all this trouble and then, <laughs> but once they touch it, because it's, you know, obviously marble stays cold, so it's... <laughs> but I, I'm sure, really, if they, if they know you though, surely they should know that it wouldn't be Korean. <laughs> well, funny enough, not everybody knows me, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe In the just... barn kitchen, the, the work surface is... Um... Stainless steel. Stainless steel, but it's... Well, that's what I wanted to go back to, actually, if we may, to um, the stain, the image with the stainless steel tops. Yeah. Um, because it's <clears> quite... Uh, it's completely seamless. There are absolutely no joints in it at all. And again, the sink is integrated. It almost looks like a very thin slate veneer, but, but it, it is actually steel. It's um, raw stainless steel, and it took 10 men to carry it into the house. Wow. The tabletop and the uh, kitchen worktop. Catherine wasn't, uh, didn't necessarily think that an idea of a stainless steel dining table was. But it's interesting when you when you touch it because of its its finish, the the, the rawness. It's it's very kind of silky feeling. It's strange. And actually, it feels very warm too. Mm. But if I need to move the table by a few inches, no, it's not it's not going anywhere. <laughs> and and I it doesn't do rock either. And I do have tables I can add to it, so I can actually seat 20 on, on the one table. And, and being steel, does that have any sort of pattern or age, or do you have to be careful with it? Other, I mean, I'm guessing sort of knife marks or something. How it, does it wear? Well, it's very, it's very, very uh, hard. Um, uh, and because it's, it's raw stainless steel, it has these uh, watermarks. So it has no sort of, um, it's got no, uh, you know, it's, it, its pattern is natural. It's just, it's just the, the raw finish. So you, you don't have, it is, it's sealed, but you don't have to do anything. It's, it's quite impervious. And, and you can put hot plates down anywhere because yeah. it's... Ah, so uh, actually... So I guess it's practical. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's got a double thumbs up. A double tick yeah, from the wife. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some of the recipes. Catherine, where did the inspiration come from for the things that you have in the book? So I think most of my biggest inspiration is my own mother. So a lot of, I learned to cook through my mother. And so quite a few of the recipes have quite a 70s kind of things like, um, hazelnut meringue cake and profiteroles and quite a 70s feel to them. Um, so she, she's my greatest inspiration. And also John's mother was a huge inspiration to me as well. So I have her very famous Yorkshire pudding as a recipe <laughs> in the book. And then my other um, inspirations came from, I, I have some very favorite London chefs who I asked to collaborate and each of them have given me two recipes which are in the book. So that is Sally Clark, Sky Gingel, Claire Patak, Otto Lenghi, Prue Leith, who's our next door neighbor, and Carol Bamford, who's also a neighbor. So yeah. I've, um, they, they um, have all contributed with two recipes to the book. And otherwise my inspiration came from friends and just restaurants I go to, um, the many, many books I have, so that I have many adapted recipes. Um, so that's my main inspiration. 
And the stuff I worked out with Annie Bell. Yes, and the yeah. stuff with Annie Bell, which I've been cooking for 20 years. And do you have, do you have um, vegetable gardens and um, do you go foraging and things? I do go foraging. So at the moment we're doing a lot of wild garlic, wild garlic pesto. I'm putting on everything now. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been making wild uh, nettle risotto. Which is my favourite. But I don't actually have a kitchen garden. I just grow the vegetables that I completely love, like broad beans. I've got an obsession by broad beans and zucchini. So I grow those, but I don't actually have a kitchen garden yet. It is a work in progress, but I haven't quite got around to doing it um, because we're very spoiled because we have a wonderful kitchen garden in the village, which is in a National Trust house. And I have Dalesford very nearby as well. So I, I haven't actually done my own kitchen garden yet. And I have chickens next door as well from the farmer. Oh, perfect. Are they all named? Are they, have they all got names? Yeah, and they're so free range. Well, they're ranging, 50 of them. So. They're <laughs> ranging all over, the, all over the road. So I've got always fresh eggs. We were amazed by it because the, the local hunt, uh, the, they sometimes exercise the hounds through through the uh, village and the, and they stop and they the 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 um the master knows the name of all 40 dogs or whatever they are it's incredible and but to me they all look the same yeah and they're much bigger than you think my god yeah, sorry they, digressing. I, think they, I just think it make a clatter when they come through <laughs> they um, do. <clears throat> what, what about the challenges um john of writing and photographing the book did you get very very involved in how it looked uh, yes, well, the, the, the book was designed by Nick in, in the office, uh, who's very, very particular. Um, and also Gilbert, who photographed the food, had never photographed food before. And I was very keen uh, not to use, uh, you know, somebody who was very set in their way. So, but it did, it, it was a learning curve. So we did, you know, there was a lot of experiment, experimental sort of stuff going on. But and of course, you know, the, the modern ways to photograph food from overhead, like these two shots. And I quite like it at an angle. So there was a bit of um, toing and froing or arguing about it. But we, and we ended up actually probably photographing um, from three different angles, which prolonged things a bit. And very, very agonizing food photography. I've learned that. <laughs> and can I ask what? whether everything has been photographed on a white plate. Was anything allowed to be photographed on anything other than uh, there's, oh, there's a hilarious moment where, because I, I, there were too many cooks in the kitchen, obviously. And so I, I, left, the, uh, I left, the, left them to it. And Nick found this um, bowl um, in, in the uh, larder, uh, which he thought would be very nice for thing. And of course, I'd hidden it because it, it, was, it was a very generous present but it was completely not my taste. And so I'd hidden it. And of course it's got pride of place in the book now. And he did say he could, he could turn down the colors, but uh, he d we didn't in the end. <laughs> but as you can see, that one is fresh brought on a cracked dish. Oh but yes, I hadn't noticed. <laughs> so it's not, it's not, everything's not everything. No, 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 but that is sort of a kind of an artwork because we, we bought it from a, um, uh, uh, quite a well-known potter in, in Mallorca and uh, we were at the studio and I saw it in the back and I said oh I'd like that and she said no no well that's a reject and I said well I love that you know the Japanese idea of imperfection I mean it was quite a good selling technique of hers I think anyway so but most other things are from John's the plates the knives the forks the salt the pepper the glasses the pots the pans he's designed all of them <laughs> Yeah, all, all this, all the stuff on the right. Yeah, those all are the tabletop. Our, those are our office design. Yeah. And John, what about making the um, lettuce behave? Did you have problems trying to <laughs> sort of? <laughs> and this color, this color on that. Look at all that color. I, can't, Yay! <laughs> I mean, uh, no, but the but the first proposal was was to have a cookbook that was just white food and possibly a bit of green, but uh, it was explained to me that um, you need tomatoes and and blood and things like that anyway well it looks, it looks absolutely beautiful um Catherine what about tell us about some of your favorite recipes 
<clears throat> my very favorite recipe is the one of that of the image of the ricotta stuffed courgette flowers. Yeah, delicious. Because it looks so pretty and it's a kind of dish you put on a table and everyone does go wow. And uh, those zucchini flowers are there for such a tiny window. And so they're so precious and they're very fiddly to make, but I just love that because it's delicate and it's very, very light to eat. So that's my very fa favorite. The other one you see there is grilled peaches with mozzarella and salad. And that's just so easy. And I mean, it's sort of no cooking. Again, it looks very, very pretty. And then my favorite pudding is the profiteroles, which was in the image before. It's just indulgent and- Very indulgent, yeah. Absolutely. And, and what about when you eat together as a family? Um, what, what would you serve for the, when the family all come together. And I understand you have a grandchild now as well, is that right? We do, yes, we do. So basically, I nobody has any say in what we're having, so I just feel in control. It's the one place where I feel in control. I'm in charge of what time we eat and what we're going to eat. And I go mad when people come in and try and pick on things while I'm cooking. Um, so we eat, John's very particular about meal times. He likes, everybody to he likes the table properly laid and there's no such thing as a tv dinner which is quite annoying because i rather love a tv dinner but we don't <laughs> have, ever have tv dinners um we try and avoid telephones at the table but it doesn't always work so he likes everything you know like a proper meal proper conversation so during lockdown there's been a lot of meals maybe too many for me but he likes you know napkins, candles at night, firelit. Which I do. That's my yeah, contribution. He does do that. And he so, and washing up. And he washes up. Thank ah, you. okay. It's, it sounds like you've got the perfect partnership, I tell you. Uh, yeah, only because Catherine is so perfect. Oh. She's married to an imperfect person. <laughs> and this um what's this wonderful cake? The plantain lemon cake with pistachio and pomegranate. And that was um, John's birthday cake and the other image is actually of a Christmas which, wow. which Christmas, has yeah. which actually has sunshine coming through the window which is well amazing during Christmas but you can see the very bare leaves on the trees oh yes um so and that, Catherine's mother yeah. yeah oh wonderful and I'm glad to see that the dogs are allowed in the kitchen because my dogs that's what they do they go and sit underneath the table in the vain hope that we're going to drop something for them. I'm afraid the dog has access all areas in our house. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll let you off. And where can we where can we buy this glorious book? Well, it's a, I think it's the I think the term is it's available at all good booksellers, but it's certainly available. Um, and Fiden have published it, um, and it and it came out um, at the end of last month, so it's 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 available. And would you do another? <laughs> Maybe in 20 years time. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, no, I, no. It's funny how you forget the, the, forget the struggle, but yeah, no. Well, I uh, congratulate- It's great fun to do, it was, it was a learning. I learned a lot by doing it. Well, I'm going to cherish my copy and um, I have done two recipes, which I can highly recommend. One was the slow cooked shoulder of lamb and the other one was the Zatar chicken, uh, which was an absolute revelation. Um, so thank you both very much indeed. It's been an absolute delight. And well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Carol. Uh, yeah, thanks, it's been it's great. I look forward to trying, um, trying, trying, well, most of them actually, I'll let you know how I get on. There's only a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> we want details. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much.